put a marker there and then go to Exodus chapter 2. 2 Samuel chapter 14. We're just going to read one verse from chapter 14, verse 14. But we're going to read first from Exodus 2. Then go back to Exodus 2 and just keep that handy because we're going to review. Uh, that's my main context. There's that verse there. Amen. So if you found Exodus chapter 2, if you're able to stand in honor of the word of God... My pages are sticking together. I apologize for that. Exodus chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 23. Join me on verse 24. We're going to go up to verse 25. And then we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 14. Exodus chapter 2. And starting at verse... Oh, let me get this turned on. There, there we go. Exodus chapter uh, 2, star verse 23 says, And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And let's read verse 25 together. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Ah, oh, they look so good. Amen. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 14, and verse 14, and let's just read that one verse, verse 14 together. It says, For we must needs die, and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, yet doth he devise means that his banish be not expelled from him. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so very much for your precious word. Truly, God, there's no other book like this book. But without your Holy Spirit, it's in vain for us. It's not the flesh that profiteth, you said, but it's spirit. And these words are spiritual. We're carnal, God. Forgive us and help us, Lord, to understand, to see these truths and speak to our hearts most of all. That we're not just hearers of the word, but doers of it, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. When I read that last passage in the book of Exodus, what jumped out at me is where it said, God had respect unto them. Now, I love that. I love that. I, 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 uh, to think, you know, I don't know about you, but to, to, to be honest, I would rather be respected than even loved. Uh, in fact, I remember we when before this COVID stuff, we had a ministry at the nursing home, and there was a lady in the nursing home, and she was there every week. And I go around, I shake hands with everybody at the start of it and at the end of the service, and try to talk a little bit with each person, and and you know just shake hands. And there was a lady that always refused to shake my hand. If I tried to talk to her, she'd go like this. But she was always there. And I finally asked her, I said, why won't you shake my hand? She goes, because I don't like you. <laughs> and so I asked her, I said, well, then why do you come? She goes, well, I don't like you, but I like what you got to say. <laughs> you know what? I like that. Yeah. I would rather they like what I got to say than like me. Amen? And uh, so I respect is possible, but imagine that. It says God had respect unto them to get God's respect. Now, the, by the way, the word respect, just to give you a little bit, there's actually a few different words translated for respect in our Bible, but it means to know or take knowledge of. In other words, because you respect them, you, you take more interest in them. You know them. In fact, another word for the respect is, is translated scrutinize, to really look at them. Amen? Because you respect them. And, and another word, word or way that's translated is to turn towards. Amen? In other words, you, when you respect you like it. In fact, the first time it appears in the beginning of Genesis is in Genesis chapter 4, verse 4. It says, And Abel, he also brought the firstling of his flock, and they have the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. 
And the second time it appears is the very next verse where it says, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. His countenance fell. So God looked and saw Abel and saw his offering. The Bible says that God did something. He showed, God showed that he respected Abel and his offering. But he also showed that he didn't respect Cain. And his offering, you know, whether God turned his back on him and he saw it, I don't know. But uh, some people believe that God sent down a fire, consumed Abel's, and left Cain's offering just sitting there on the altar. Amen. But we're not sure on that. But it was obvious to both that God respected Abel, but it says didn't respect Cain. In fact, that word respect is found 42 other times in that scripture. Now, let me say this. Most of the time, it is in the negative sense. In that God's Bible says, don't be a respecter of persons. In that you are treat people differently because of who they are, or, or their education, or their money, or their color, or whatever it is. The Bible says, no, that is wrong. Don't have the faith of God with respect of persons. In fact, it even mentions, like a we read in our text there in 2 Samuel chapter 14 verse 14 that God it, uh, God, it says neither doth God respect any persons. By that meaning God treats everybody the same. Uh, Job 37 verse 24 says men do therefore fear him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. Now I like that. Even if you're wise in heart the Bible says it's not impressing God. By the way, your wisdom is foolishness compared to God. Right. Amen. Romans 2.11 says, For there is no respect of persons with God. We're all, God treats us all the same way. Ephesians 6, 9 says, And ye masters, do the same unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master, who is in heaven, neither is the respect of persons with him. God treats everybody the same, no matter who you are. First uh, Peter 1, 17 says, And if he call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your soul journeying there in fear. So the Bible says, understand something. God is not a respecter of persons, he says. Makes it really clear. He doesn't treat anybody different. That's why I, I'm against these. There, there's a teaching in some churches where God picks somebody. You know, you, I'll take to heaven. You're headed to hell. And you, heaven, and you, hell. And I'm not going to go through everybody and send you to some place or another here. Uh, that makes God a respecter in the pers uh, of persons. Amen? By the way, it it also does away with something in the Bible called whosoever. Amen. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's not willing that any perish but all come to repentance. God says everybody has the same chance in life. God is no respecter of persons. He is good to the just and to the unjust. He's merciful to the, to, to the, to the good and to the evil. God does not have respect of persons. He doesn't care how much money you make. Uh, by the way, you're leaving it all behind there. Uh, he doesn't care about your education. He doesn't care about your position. He doesn't care about your power. Uh, and nothing impresses God one centimeter. Amen. He does not have respect of persons. But then we read in our text, and God had respect unto them. Meaning they caught God's attention. We saw Abel. It says, and God respected, had respect unto Abel and his offering. So God did show some people get their, his attention. And, it, and, it got, and in fact, there's a number of other verses which mention that too. Uh, Leviticus 26 9 says, For I will, God says, For I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful, multiply, and establish my covenant with you. Psalm 138, verse 6 says, that Though the Lord is high, be high, yet hath we respect unto the lowly. So though God doesn't have respect of persons in that he treats everybody the same, the scriptures also make it clear, yes, God does have respect for certain people in that he, they get greater attention. God is more looking towards them. 
they get the face of God, not the back of God. <laughs> By the way, that's what's Israel's prayer every day. Lord, cause thy face to shine upon us. What's that mean? Have respect unto us. Amen? So I don't know about you, but if I want respect of anybody, and like I said, I like respect. How do I get God's respect? Well, in our text there, and by the way, remember, he respecteth no persons. That means he treats everybody the same. So if you're the same as this, God treats you the same as them. Because God's no respecter of persons, but that's how we get his respect. Amen? A few things I noticed in our text. The first one, you need to be lowly. It says in our text in Exodus 2, verse 23, And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. Now what does it mean they were in bondage? They were slaves. They were slaves in Egypt. And you've got to understand, a slave is considered the lowest of people. In fact... They were not considered people. They were considered property. You, you owned a slave. You don't own people. So when they became slaves, they were property. Amen? And I believe that got God's attention. Amen? Why? Because the scripture said, we read that verse earlier, Psalm 138, verse 6. Let me read it again. Though the Lord be high... Yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. What does that mean? God says, when you're lowly, I'm watching you. He said, when you're proud, eh, I'm getting away from that. And, and, and by the way, that makes per perfect sense for a person that has no respect, or there's no respect of persons, because nobody, like I said, you don't impress God. First off, everything you got, you got from God. Yeah? Oh, well, look at these muscles. Uh, well, by the way, someday they're going to be like, <laughs> they go from up here to down there. Amen. Big chest. You get Dunlop disease. Where Dunlop down below your belt there. Amen. And uh, I called it the, the furniture disease. That's when the chest drops down to the drawers. Amen. And uh, and uh, and you're so smart. First off, you got it from somebody else. And I have news for you. You were going to lose it too. Amen. You know, well, look at all the money I got and try to keep it. You know, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm saying here that everything you are, you got. Amen? Amen? And by the way, and it all goes back to God because he created everything. You came into this world naked and you're going out naked. No difference. So to think of yourself better to somebody than somebody else, the Bible says that's an abomination unto God. That's pride. And it's an abomination to God. And that's why he says, he says uh, but the proud uh, are far off. I know, I respect the lowly, but the proud are far off. So if you want God's respect, you must be lowly. In fact, it's amazing because he set the example. When our Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, remember, that's the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And Jesus himself said in that great invitation, Matthew 28, 11, 28, where he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. The very next verse, verse 29, says, And take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek, and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus, when you study his life, did, though he's king of kings and lord of lords, though he's, he's the son of God that became flesh, he made himself a servant to all. In fact, before his betrayal, 
the Bible says when they were up in that upper room and in the Middle East by the way when you sit down you don't sit down they didn't have chairs you know despite the painting from the artists of the, of the Last Supper where they all sit on chairs they didn't have chairs they sat on the floor which means when you sit you sit and you sit on top of your feet well the problem is you're walking around in dirt and you're wearing sandals so guess what your behinds gonna look like when you stand up <laughs> So what do you do? You, as soon as you get into a house, you slip off your sandals and they wash your feet. However, it's usually the lowest person that does it. Well, when Jesus is there together with the disciples for the Passover, the last dinner together, the Bible says Jesus took a garment, put it around himself, and started washing all their feet. Remember Peter trying to, no, Lord, you're not going to wash me. If I don't wash you, you have no part of me. By the way, you must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Jesus has to wash you. But anyways, he said that this was an example. And he said these words in John chapter 13, verse 13. He called me Master and Lord. And ye say, well, for so I am. He is our Master. He is our Lord. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God. And verse 14 says, If then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. In other words, don't get yourself that you're better than anybody else. Be a servant. A servant. To others and that's what he taught his disciples continually to have that mindset that you're to be my servant you're not person you're your property by the way you're owned by him you are not your own for you are bought with a price you are his servant you ever realize what that word redeemed means you've been purchased you know, well, I'm redeemed. Yeah. Hey, he bought me from him. But that means I, I now owe him. He owns me. <laughs> and it says he brought the captivity captive. Yeah, he set me free. Yeah, but now you're his captive. Amen? He owns you. We're his servants. In Luke 17, he gave a great example to his disciples when he said, Lord, increase our faith. Well, we want that miracle working faith. And Jesus said, you know, which of you, Luke 17, verse 7, which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down and meet. And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink so and which is obvious you're, you're this servant you're this slave you work the field you're hungry you're tired yeah you, know, you get back you're you're still the servant so what do you do you got to serve the master well i'm hungry he comes first you're the servant you serve him and then by the way next thing he says doth he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded of him i throw not no why you're supposed to do that. Right. Then he said these words, So likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. We are to have, the Bible says, that mindset that we are <coughs> servants. Yeah. And there's a benefit for that. Because God respecteth the lowly. And you got to understand, you know, I, I, in fact, I, I titled that, How Do I Earn God's Respect? But there's something you got to understand. It's really God's grace. You know, we don't earn anything from God. If, if we got what we deserve, we'd be in hell. Amen. But there's another great truth in the Bible. It's found in James 4, 6. It says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, say, God resisteth the power, but giveth grace unto the humble. You want more grace? And by the way, if you want, meaning you want more from God, it's only by grace. The Bible says you get more grace when you are humble. And so that's the first step. You want God's respect? He must be lowly.
Humble yourself. The second thing I see in our text is we need to cry unto him. Again, that same verse there in verse 23, Exodus 2, verse 23, and it came to pass in process of time. King of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of bondage, and they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. Now, I like that. They not just, they weren't complaining, they were crying. But they were crying to the right source, unto God. And by the way, I like that. They cried unto God. What does that mean? Their heart. You know, God's not interested in just the words you say. Remember, He can see your thoughts and He knows your heart. But they were crying and sighing by the reason of the bondage. And it got God's attention. It got God's attention there. And I believe it got God to respect them. You know, the longest prayer in the Bible was made by King Solomon when he was dedicating the house of God. And Solomon knew that though he built this great house with all the gold, he, he, you know, folks, we're not putting God in this house. Um, can't fit him. But like Jesus said, he was building a house of prayer. And what he's saying is, when I'm dedicating this house so that when we use this house as a house of prayer, God will respect us. In fact, these are his exact words in 1 Kings 8, 27. He says, But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built it. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant. Yeah, I love that. Solomon was king over Israel. Wisest man on the face of the earth. Amen. Richest man on the face of the earth. But he realized, I'm his servant. And God, <laughs> I want your respect. So have respect unto the prayers. He says, and thou, yet thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication. That's pleading. O Lord, my God, to hearken unto the cry and to prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee this day. You know, God's no respecter of persons, but the prayers of the lowly gets God's attention and takes those steps where God has respect to them. There's a third thing I notice in our text here, in the next verse there. It says, in, again, in Exodus 2, verse 24 now, it says, And God heard the groaning, and God remembered the covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now, God does not have respect of persons, but let me say this, He does have respect for His covenant. A covenant is a promise. Amen? And, uh, and uh, listen to me, uh, uh, my wife, I made a promise to her. She's my wife. We have a covenant. By the way, that's what marriage is. It's a covenant. It's a, in fact, you know, in some states, you don't even sign the marriage certificate. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. You made a covenant. God's in it. And that sticks. And that means she's, other than God, she's the next one. Amen? And God respects His covenant. In fact, uh, again, Leviticus 26.9, I read this earlier, it says, For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. Psalm 74, verse 20 says, Have respect unto thy covenant. Now the thing is, how do I... And how do you get under the covenant of God? Well, first off, understand something. The word covenant comes from a word that means cutting. Because the way a covenant was made is they took the sacrifices and actually cut them in half, and it's a bloody mess. And you walk through it. And so you didn't walk down a white aisle, you walked down a red aisle. It was a bloody mess. If you remember Abraham's covenant with God, how they split the animals. 
But let me say this, it has to be the right sacrifice to get into a covenant with God. Remember that first text in Genesis chapter 4 that I told you about Abel? It says, and Abel, he also brought the firstling of the flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. You got it right. You get into the covenant. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. Cain was wroth in his condescension. Now, I understand that because, to be honest, you know who did more work for his offering? Cain. It's a lot harder being a farmer than be, be, being a herdman. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, first off, the sheep got there, you just watched it get born. And then you, it gets up and feeds itself. And all you're doing is watching so the idiot doesn't walk off a cliff. You know, the good shepherd. You're watching dumb sheep. But you pretty much, they take care of themselves. Just make sure nothing eats them. Amen? You know? But a farmer, he has to break up the ground. Get rid of all the weeds. Plant the seeds. Fertilize it. Water it. Watch over it because then the weeds come back. They go faster than the plants do. And weed it again. And weed it again. And then finally, then you got to pick it. And maybe peel it or whatever if it's corn, you know. And then you can offer your sacrifice. All Abel had to do, hmm, oh, that's a nice young lamb. You become my offering. He did the most work. God didn't have respect. Why? Because I don't want all your work. I want the lamb. And by the way, let me say this, and there's only one lamb that God really wants. Like John the Baptist, when he saw the Jesus Christ come, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That is the Lamb. And by faith and trust in that Lamb, you get into the covenant with God. It says there that God, God remembered His covenant. He remembered a, His covenant with Abraham. And I, when God saw that, saw the children of Israel, you know what he, it says? He remembered. The covenant. He saw, he's seen Abraham. He's seen Isaac. He's seen Jacob. You know what? When you make a covenant with God and accept the Lord Jesus Christ, He looks down on you. You know who He's seeing? He remembers Jesus. He sees His Son. And He likes His Son. Behold, my Son, in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> Glad you're seeing Him instead of me. <laughs> because that leads to respect you but you got to be in the right covenant and you only get into the right covenant if you got the right sacrifice amen let's get back to our text there's one more point here that i see in our text here in exodus 2 verse 24 what we read and god heard the groaning there's the crying god remembered his covenant with abraham with isaac and with jacob that's what he saw in the covenant and god looked upon the children of israel God had respect unto them. I like that. You see, respect is earned. You know, somebody may get a position, but you know, they didn't earn the respect of it. But it says God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. And it makes me think, what did he see that caused them to respect. It doesn't say in our text there. However, there is one in the Bible that we see God giving a lot of extra attention to. And when God's looking down from heaven, what he sees that caused him to respect somebody, and his name was Job. In Job chapter 1, verse 8, as it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? By the way, notice that first thing. He's a servant. God is, God's attention was on Job. He respected him. It says, And hast thou considered my servant Job? He's a servant. That's the first thing. God likes that. And there's none like him in the earth. That's the second thing. He stood out. 
You see, he was in the world, but he was not of the world. He stood out. He was a light in a dark place. He was salt in a corrupt world. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. You know, well, we've got to fit in. No, you don't. You have to stand out. Yeah? You know? You're supposed to be a peculiar person unto Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you're a weirdo. But it means you're like Christ. You stand out in the crowd. It says here, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. And then it says this, A perfect man. Now, let, let, don't get this wrong, because we're not, nobody's sinless. In fact, if we say that we have no sin, the Bible says we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we still do. But the word perfect means complete. Entire. In fact, one of the things that talks about Job is Job had integrity. Integrity means soundness. Um, if you, every so often, uh, I have to purchase some parts from a junkyard to replace parts on your car that might have been damaged. When I purchase them, I do a test, what's called a Magniflux test. What's that to do? To test the integrity of that metal. Is that metal still the same strength? What he's saying is, Job is a perfect man. He has integrity. He is the same inside and out. No cracks there. Yes, he's not perfect. He, he does, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But this guy gets it right, right away because the heart's right. He was a perfect man. And then it says, and an upright man. Upright just means that he, he's walking right with God. Amen? He respects God and God's w words and God's way. By the way, let me say this. You're never going to get God's respect if you don't respect His, his words, His way. Amen? And uh, vital thing, and Job did. In fact, Job himself said these words in the book of Job 23, verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I love that verse. In fact, I kind of make it from it. I took from that and esteemed his words more than my necessary food. No Bible, no breakfast. I used to tell my kids that. No Bible, no breakfast. Why? God's word should be more important to you than food. Amen? And, uh, and, and not just his word, but keeping his commandments. And that's what Job said he did. He had respect unto the Lord in all his ways. God says, I like that. By the way, the last one says, it says, uh, Hast thou seen my servant Job, when he, that there's none like him on earth, uh, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God, and as cheweth evil. Now the word feareth is the word reverence, which, by the way, gets that word respect from. He had enough respect for God not to go against God. And by the way, it ends with that E-T-H. Anybody remember when you see King James Bible has that ending E-T-H? What does that mean? Continue. Continual. Continual. Oh, Job has some hard times, real hard times in life. But you know what? He never lost his respect for God, his fear of God. And escheweth evil, again, E-T-H, he hates it. He hated evil. The Bible says he kept that. I, I love that verse in, in, in the book of Job where he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He's still God. He's still on the throne. And God's looking down and he's bragging on a man. I would say God respected him. He's bragging. And remember, God's no respect of persons. That means the same would go for us. Right? The same with us. He treats nobody different. And in our text there, it says God had respect of them. Why? Well, they're servants. They see themselves servants to the lowly. That gets God's attention. They're crying unto me. 
that gets God's attention. I like that. He respect unto the prayers. And then he says, that, and, and, and not only that, but they're under my covenant. They got the right sacrifice. Amen. By the way, it was that lamb that got them out of Egypt. Yes. When I see the blood, I'll pass over. That's where the word pass over came from. I'll pass over them. They got the right sacrifice. I remember that covenant. That got God's respect. And then the last thing it says, and God looked on them. What's God seeing in our life? I don't know about you, but I'd love to have the respect. I like to have good respect from people, but more than that, respect from the one that really counts. And God's no respect of persons. What does that mean? You can have the same thing if you do the same thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this truth today. What a tremendous phrase there when it says God had respect to them. And God, I don't know about everybody in here, but I know my own heart. That's what I long for. I don't deserve it. But I am under your covenant. I've trusted the Lamb. And just like Abel, you had respect unto Abel and to his sacrifice. Have the same sacrifice today, God. And I pray, Father, for myself and everybody here in these words now. Lord, help us to take those same steps. Because I believe everybody here has that same desire right now that we might earn that respect that only comes from God. Bless now this invitation time, I pray, Lord. In Jesus' name, with heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around when I'm say, preacher, I may not be the be best Christian world, but there's a thing. I know I'm in that covenant because I've trusted that Jesus Christ is my lamb. If you've done that, if you know for sure you're saved today, would you lift your hand high? You know that's for sure. God bless you. Thank you. May lower your hands. If not, again, it's whosoever. You know, Cain offered the same sacrifice as Abel. He'd have got the same respect. And Christ died for all of us. You just got to accept it as your sacrifice today. Do that today. If you haven't, by faith, put your faith and trust in Him and call on Him to be your Savior today. But then, in that covenant, God's looking. Cry unto Him. He's looking to make sure we're lowly. We're his servants, and we call on him. And he's looking at us to earn his respect, like Job. Let's be somebody that God can look down and, let me say this, and be proud of, and not somebody he'd rather not see. Father, bless now this invitation time. And speak to our hearts, I pray, dear Lord. For it's in your precious name, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, I just take some time to talk to the Lord. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ, do it now. Don't put it off. So the music plays.